Good afternoon and welcome. I'm pleased to be here today with Dan Cunningham of One Day in July. He is the founder and principal, and we're so glad that you could join us today. Thank you, it's good to be here. Well, we were just saying that we have not spoken together. I mean, we've seen each other in the street, but we haven't spoken together since 2017. Beginning of 2017, yeah. And that's when you started One Day in July. It was, it was just starting out, yep. So, um, all right, so how has the business changed? Well, it's grown a lot. There's 17 or 18 of us now, as opposed wow. to just me. Wow. Uh, this is the last time I talked to you. And and it's bigger. It's We manage a little over $600 million, largely actually of Vermonters' money. It's largely st still in state. Incredible. And so, index funds was really what you were talking mostly about. Is that still the nature of that's the business? Still the, that's still the focus. I mean, we definitely do manage other things because they come in that way, but we um, we really try to get to index funds, low cost portfolios, helping people understand uh, our fee. Actually from the start of the, of the company, the link next to the logo has been how we're paid in a very clear table, which is, we're kind of proud of that because it's always, we've always been very transparent about how we're paid and then trying to help people understand how the financial industry makes so much money from them. Through the fees. Through the fees and and through like the big brokerage houses like Fidelity and and others. I mean, they're all holding so much cash and they use your money, they use your cash to loan and then they make money on the spread. That type of thing is a cost to you. It's just very quiet and hard to see through. So tell us, just remind us about index funds and why you think they're an ideal investment vehicle. Well, index funds don't, they don't have highly paid managers making stock picks behind the scenes. They basically go out to an asset class like large US companies or, or US treasury bonds and they just buy the whole thing. They don't try to guess where the winners and the losers are gonna be. And then they strip out as many costs as they can. You know, they can often get the cost down to a 25th of what an active fund is. And academic work over the past 40 or 50 years shows that inconclusively, uh, you should be investing in indexes. Um, and that's not really, at one point that was a debate. That's not really much of a debate. Yes, you can beat an index, but it's very rare that, that people do. And how are they different from mutual funds? Uh, well, a mutual fund can be a type of index fund, but a lot of mutual funds are actively managed where people are making stock picks behind the scenes and, and generating taxes potentially. And, and driving up the cost of management. Driving up the cost, yep. Got it. And what are examples of uh, categories of index funds? Well, you might have a small cap index or a small capitalization stock. So those are, you know, a billion dollar market cap. I mean, it doesn't sound too small, but that's so, considered small in the market. Um, or so businesses you, that are operating with a billion dollar budget. Is that what? Well, no, it's, that'd be like a billion dollar valuation. Got it. Or you might have a large cap index where, you know, firms like Apple, um, Google, John Deere, they'll trade in that type of in that type of index. And they're very diversified as well. So you're also kind of looking to control your risks. Um, but the premise of One Day in July was, all, was from the beginning that it, it's not clear to people uh, what's happening. And- In terms of fees and management? Yeah, and I think the, you can really, if you make something sound sophisticated and complicated, you can really figure out a lot of ways, I think, to fool people. And charge them. And charge them. And the whole point is that you shouldn't need a regulator to tell you not to do that. Like, that's, fa that's fairly unethical, I think. Like, you should really say, we're being paid by somebody. We should act in their interest. Um, it's, that does not, a lot of the time, that does not happen. So let's talk about the economic picture today. There's it's there's a lot of upheaval. People hear about the market going down and then went up the other day, and and you know interest rates are going up. What? How would you summarize t today's economic picture? Well, there is a lot of volatility. I personally think a, much of the progress that we've made, and and we, by we I mean the 
the country has made in moving towards index funds has been lost because of devices. As people see information constantly, it causes them to trade at the wrong times or they, they get anxious, you know, because the market is constantly there. It's hard to get away from it. It's on TV everywhere, it's on your phone. And you have, you have these days swinging, like you said, up, down, up, down, <laughs> like, what is this? You know, if you buy a building, it doesn't tell you what it's worth every five seconds. But that is, and partly I think people are trying to figure out all the different news sources and variables. You know, the market's trying to figure it out. It's really unprecedented. You have enormous amounts of cash um, that have been printed and then in people's uh, accounts. And then you have an economic situation that looks like it might be deteriorating. But maybe not. Like the earnings and companies are coming in pretty well. Yeah. So, ta so what's the real? I mean, aside from the ups and downs and the changes in interest rates and things like that, wh what's your assessment of the current economic order? Well, I mean, I think that I think there. Um, it's important to remember as an investor that bad news. When you feel bad and you think, "Well, this does not look good economically," that is probably going to be the best time to invest. People tend to invest when they're happy and things are going well, but big returns are made when things are going poorly because that's when people sell the equity market. And so you have to decouple your emotions from investing or else it'll be hard to do well. That's easy to say, but it definitely is tougher to do. It's you want to really buy as much as you can when the markets are declining. But don't you also, in that case, have to have a kind of analysis so that you're prepared? I mean, I, I see it, you know, the analogy is buy, buying real estate. If you have figured out where you want to live, how much you can spend, how much cash you have, and then you go and look at houses, you're ready yeah. when the opportunity presents itself because in your mind, you know what it is that you want to buy. Yes, it's good to definitely have a sense of, you know, what is my time frame before I need this money back? How much risk can I really take on before the you know the anxiety that the market may cause may affect my own behavior? Those are the kinds of things that you want to think about before you get into it. And what about the kinds of things to invest in? I mean, you said it's a good time to buy when people are selling because the price is less, but don't you want to have an idea in your head of what you want to buy and what is valuable? more valuable to buy in a downtime? You do. I mean, that's we, we have spent a lot of years trying to figure that out in terms of making sure that portfolios are well diversified across asset classes and that different investments are, it's almost like a matrix. It's different investments are there for different purposes and it all holds together as one portfolio. So part of the portfolio might be to protect against inflation. Part of the portfolio is to really have large capital gains over time, those types of things. And what do you invest in to protect against inflation, for example? Well, I mean, historically, things like real estate, uh, and actually over the medium term to long term, uh, things like stocks, because the, as, it, as inflation comes through, like just think about a company like Procter & Gamble. As they're faced with inflation, they're going to raise their prices over time, and eventually those earnings are going to come down to the bottom line and their profits will go up. It doesn't mean their real profits will go up, but their dollar profits will go up. And, and that protects you more than most bonds. Most bonds are just fixed contracts. So you mean a company like Procter & Gamble has flexibility as a business to change their pricing structure in response? Change their pricing, yep. Unlike a bond, which is, as you said, it's fixed. Most bonds are fixed and you're locked into that that payment stream, if there's a lot of inflation, the payment stream is worth less. So what do you think about treasury bills as a 12-month investment right now? Well, it's they're paying about 4.63% on the one-year treasury. So what's interesting to me is that's effectively risk-free. If the United States government exists in a year and pays on its debt, <laughs> you know, I used to think that was a joke, but I guess now, now there, guess there's a tiny, tiny risk that that might not happen, but you're gonna make 4.63%. What's interesting is 
banks, the, the best CDs you can get right now are about 4%, and, um, and checking deposits are about around 2%. And so that doesn't really make any sense because the treasury bond is liquid. You can sell it at any time without a penalty. And it's effectively risk-free because it's the US government. Whereas a bank, well, the, US, the bank is protected for most CDs by the US government, but they're generally penalties to get out of things like CDs. And so it doesn't, but that's why right now I think banks are doing well because they have this spread and, um, and a lot of people don't know that their money could be making more money somewhere else. Oh, so the banks are investing in T-bills, for example, and making that 0.63 and then giving you 4%. They could, yeah. So they could kind of have a risk-free trade going. I see. A lot of the hedge funds did that in 2008. They were getting money effectively free from the U.S. government and turning around and buying treasury bills. It's a, a risk-free way. I mean, it's ridiculous, but it was happening. So uh, tech stocks, uh, social media stocks, For I mean, there's tech is the big category, but then you're looking at the the um, even Amazon and Google laying off lots of people. What's yeah. happening there? Google's an interesting company because it's a little bit like uh, Walmart in that it's a bellwether for the economy. You can see things that are happening because it's so big. And... Google missed its earnings numbers last quarter fairly substantially. And I think that's probably an indicator that companies are they're cutting their marketing budgets because that's where they can cut. And there's a tendency to hold on to staff. Like, I don't think firms want to let go of people. They have, they've had such a hard time getting, them. getting people that they're really reticent to, to <laughs> reverse course on that. And in a way, that's good. You know, maybe that spreads out it makes life less painful for people. But um, but to counter that, I think you can see that the marketing budgets are being hit already. And, you know, big tech is going to have to adjust. They're, they're probably, I mean, I don't, I don't know if they're 50% overstaffed. You have to get rid of 50% of staff in a week, but they're probably overstaffed. And I mean, wh why? There's, there's so much money flowing in, you know. It's, I've thought about this a lot. I grew up in Southern Vermont. You know, we had the Bangton Banner, and and people supported the banner. And and what these firms have been able to do is they've been able to reach into every community, every little community in the country, every big city, and just extract enormous amounts of money flowing into. If you've ever been to their campuses, I worked for Microsoft in college in Redmond, and I mean, it's just like unbelievable how much money is coming in, and. Now they may have to adjust a little bit. And why is there less money coming in? What's that? Why is there less money coming into to these firms? Facebook and Google and Amazon. Well, I mean, I think it's Facebook's getting hit the most because their ads are simply the least valuable. I mean, Google's ads are worth more generally. I think mm. most, not everyone would agree, but most marketers would hold on to their Google budget before their Facebook budget. Mm -hmm. um, and and you know, and Facebook has has spent a lot of money on this metaverse idea, which doesn't seem to be taking off. Um, but uh, they have they you know, and they had a big tailwind from the pandemic era. So all of those things are starting to peel back at the same time. I don't think anyone is too sad for them. I mean, they still are enormously profitable firms. So one of the things we were talking about before is that the market is not performing well, or it's pretty volatile this year. Uh, but last year it performed very well. So I know that people are upset that yeah. the value of their stocks are down, but they, they made 20% in 2021. So to talk about the trends in the market and how to watch. Well, that's important because it, there's a saying in finance that you can, you can prove or disprove anything by the starting and ending dates of the graph. And... It happened that the market really peaked right around January 1st of this year. But if you back up a little bit more in time to last summer, uh, we're basically where we were. I mean, summer of 2021 forward. And so you have to remember the market was running up substantially in 2021. And, uh, and so now some of that is just valuation. The valuations are, are coming down and resetting in some asset classes, like small cap, they're historically pretty cheap now. But 
part of investing is that there are years, it's roughly about every seventh year on the S&P 500 that you lose money. Things don't always, they don't go up in straight lines. But do you still think that the market as a long-term investment vehicle is, is a healthy enterprise and worth? I do. I mean, I think it's, it's funny, you know, you could be a pessimist and short the market, and you sound really intelligent when you're a pessimist. It's funny, but you say things and you're like, oh, I didn't know that was, that was going to blow up. Or, but an optimist don't necessarily sound intelligent. So you see it a lot in the media, in the, in the national media, you always see these very negative stories about all these things that are going to happen. And that would, have been a re, that would have been a terrible bet over the past 10, 50, or 100 years to bet against the United States. A lot of people did, it did not work out well. Like the people who were optimists ended up far wealthier. And I, I think that's just part of kind of what, what works in the news. But in terms of the growth of the markets and the NASDAQ and the Dow and the, the value of business in the United States, it seems to just essentially be growing, growing, growing. I mean, and if you're calm and you keep your money in the market, no matter what happens up or down, it ultimately increases in value, right? I mean, is that it has. true? Yeah, I mean, there can be long periods of time like the 1970s and the 1930s where things kind of bounce around. It doesn't necessarily mean next year is gonna be great, but over time, I mean, the United States does tend to work its issues out. It's kind of amazing, like especially relative to the rest of the world at the moment. Like, it, I mean, people are kind of down on the U.S. for a lot of reasons, a lot of valid reasons, frankly. But we, relative to the rest of the world, we have our act together right now pretty well. In what respect would you? I mean, we have a, there, there is, as of today, at least rule of law. There's a very good court system. There's a very well-developed bankruptcy system, which is critical to an economy. Uh, Americans are actually fairly ethical. <laughs> I know, you, don't, I know like, you may not think that with, like, with what's going on politically, but there is a culture in, in the United States of not cheating people, and that doesn't exist in every other nation. I mean, a lot of nations are not quite as honest, so it's hard to do business. We have a big financial system. We have a... a historical culture of taking risks. I think it goes back to kind of westward expansion. Um, you know, those things are, we, so we break out of the box, we come up with new industries. Um, so should we be worried about how much uh, money the government's printing? I mean, I, I think that's definitely a cause for concern. I, I, I don't think people have, I don't think people realize how much money got printed. Like a trillion dollars is not a billion. It's not a little bit more than a billion. And the, the checkable deposits in, um, in consumers' bank accounts, in, in individual citizens' bank accounts as well, including nonprofits, is about $5 trillion today. That was about a trillion before the pandemic. So the money that's been produced is tremendous. And that's just never happened at that percentage level. It didn't happen in World War II. I mean, it's just a mind boggling amount of money. And so what impact will that have on the value of, on, well, what impact will that have? Well, I think it's, you know, you're seeing very high inflation rates and, uh, and the Federal Reserve, it's an interesting dynamic because on one hand, the, the, lead, the political arm, the White House, um, and the Federal Reserve are kind of fighting each other. The Federal Reserve is trying to get inflation under control. And, um, and that could be difficult with that much money because the money hasn't even all flown through the system yet. A lot of it hasn't been assigned to projects and things. And so the Fed governors expect the interest rates to stop at around 5%, but there is a probability that that could go a lot higher than that to, to slow the inflation down. And why is raising the interest rate seen as the mechanism for slowing inflation? Could you explain that? It just puts a break on it puts a break on the economy and on transaction flow because as things get more expensive, like like using automobiles as an example, as the loan costs go up, people start to reconsider the decision. 
And then as the, as the transaction volume slows, the auto dealer starts saying, well, you know what, to try to get the transaction volume back, I need to lower the price. Or last weekend, the board of directors of Walmart met and said, we are not going to take any more price increases. We have enough inventory that it's up to the suppliers to be more creative. So they're putting a hard stop in. Walmart has a, they have a lot of market power so they can determine what the prices are. What the prices are going to be. They have not that power shifting back to the retailers now. And that should help to kind of break inflation somewhat. But I don't understand that how slowing the economy breaks inflation. Well, just in that everybody who participates has to start to say, well, I'm going to use price to try to get my business back. Um, or, and that includes in the labor market. So like to get the, the transaction volume going again, I'm going to cut prices or I'm going to hold prices where they are. I'm going to start, start promoting things at lower prices. But then don't you run the risk of having to lay people off because you're not getting the money? Well, yeah, that, that does trickle through to the labor market. So then the labor cost starts to come down as well. So you have, you have less inflation from the labor market because you either don't want more labor or, you're, or some, a business is going to ask for it at a lower price. I don't know. It just doesn't sound very like a good outcome. Well, yeah. I mean, it, you could go the other way and get into a deflationary place, but it's it's not necessarily it's not necessarily painless. Like it's breaking in like Volcker broke inflation in in the early '80s, and it was a very severe recession. But what if they did nothing with the with the with the interest rates? What if they kept them at three percent? then it, you would probably, what they fear is they fear inflation being baked in so that an expectation starts to set in that prices are going to keep rising. And um, I see. So not to interrupt you, but so the housing market is, uh, is concrete. I can understand that. As long as the interest rates were low, the um, people were, it was easier for them to borrow money to buy a house yeah. And the rates, the prices of the housing was going up and up and up for other reasons, not just the interest rates. Combination of reasons, yeah. But the slowing, the, the making it more expensive to borrow money is slowing down the real estate market. Right. Which then means that the prices of the housing stock is coming down yeah. in order to move that housing stock. That's right. So it's cooling the increase. It's cooling the increase. Businesses in the country, they, uh, economies tend to like predictable outcomes. So, you know, a two percent inflation rate or something between two and three percent is good. So I can see why that would be good for real estate because it's been the value of it is in the kind of in the minds of the beholders. Yeah. But a product that Walmart buys from a company seems a, a kind of a different kind of animal if you're trying to limit the, the price of it because the cost is labor and materials and that's not in the eye of the beholder or is it well i mean i i think like the re one of the reasons why the federal reserve doesn't want those prices going up or taking walmart as an example is inflation disproportionately harms the lower class and lower middle class people economically you know, wealthier people can absorb inflation more. So someone like Walmart is going to say, you know, that's bad for our customers. That's bad for us as a business because they're they're going to buy less stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, whether or not you need it is a different question. Well, but there's that. They're gonna, <laughs> they're gonna buy less stuff. And, um, and so we're gonna try to hold the line and we're gonna tell Procter & Gamble that no, you have to come up with some, something else now to do this, to produce this in a more efficient way. Okay, so um, how do people get in touch with you and when they, so do people call you when they inherit some money or they decide to start saving as a young person for their job? Who comes to you and why? It's a broad range at One Day in July. And one of the things that, that I've actually learned in, the, in this is that 
Only about one in a hundred Americans have a financial advisor at all. And our firm is set up so that we, we serve as a very broad range of people, people who are starting out and people who are older and have significant sums. It's partly, we like it, it keeps the job interesting. Partly it's also, that's I think what the need is in the country is I, most of the firms want to go to the high end. I mean, honestly, that's where, you know, the focus is. That is not the focus of One Day in July. We're trying to really look at something that um, helps everybody. And so how do people get in touch with you? I think we have some info. We may not have it on yet, though. If they just search for One Day in July yeah. online, it, the information's there. Oh, there it is. And we have about um, 10 advisors around um, Vermont that can help. And what if I already have a portfolio that's invested in other things? Is there a reason I would come to you? Yeah, I mean, we have an internal software team ourselves, and we've built something called the simulator. So we can, people will often ask, well, how am I doing or how can I see what is going on? And so we can go back to take statements from five or seven years ago put that in the simulator and show them, okay, well, if you invested in low cost index funds after fees, you should be here. Mm -hmm. And then they can look at that independent of us and say, well, you know, where am I relative to that point? Right, and how, what would the incentive for them to be selling their current equities to put them in index funds now? Well, right now with a lot of equities down, it's actually easier to switch because there aren't as many tax issues. Right. So at the moment, it's a good time for a lot of people. It's pretty, it's easy, yeah. And in, in retirement accounts, there are no tax issues. And even if there are, sometimes we just try to hold positions mm -hmm. and work our way around it. Yeah. Well, I'm so glad to, <laughs> that you came to visit. I always find it invigorating, and I always learn something. So Dan Cunningham, thanks so much for joining us one day in July. And I think it's important just to know that Dan and his team are interested in transparency and in education, which I think is really important in a financial advisor who has got your interests at heart. So it's good to hear, and thanks so much. Yes, thank you for having me. Great to see you. Thanks for watching.